Long days and pleasant nights, you members of my quartet. I'm the Colonel, welcoming you to this special episode of Movies That Pop, devoted to the filmed adaptations of my favorite author, and probably yours too if you understood my greeting, Stephen King! Throughout the course of his legendary career, King's works have been adapted into movies and TV shows with wildly varying levels of faithfulness to the original source material. If you don't believe me, check out the original short story he wrote called The Lawnmower Man. Don't worry, I'll wait, it won't take long. And wildly varying levels of quality. Today, the bibliography of Stephen King is just as timely as ever, with the two-part adaptation of It coming at us in September, and the long, and I do mean long-awaited, cinematic adaptation of his seven-book master opus, The Dark Tower, finally, allegedly, hitting theaters in August, though it does keep getting delayed. Never a good sign. Today we're going to talk about simply the best. Here are the adaptations of Stephen King's work that have stood the test of time and become classics in their own right. At number 10, well, all right, Cat's Eye was almost here at number 10. That collection of three of his short stories, of which two were brilliant and the third was really kind of silly. But ultimately, I have to give the number 10 spot to a film that I resisted when it first came out because I had loved the book upon which it is based so much and I didn't feel that this film captured the book for me and that's The Green Mile. But fine, fine. I gave it another look recently and with a little emotional distance created by a long span of time, I suppose it's a fine movie in its own right, although it's a little heavy-handed with its Christ metaphors and its tale of the doomed but noble convict with magical healing powers named John Coffey. See those initials? Just a little heavy-handed. Okay? And the way that Coffee touches the lives of all those around him. This is the first film on this list directed by Frank Darabont. Pay attention, because it won't be the last. At number nine is the very first feature film to be adapted from a King novel, and it's directed by the great Brian De Palma and Abby Carey. The movie that I love so much because it is about so much under the surface. This story of a bullied teenager with telekinetic powers who comes into her own is a metaphor for the power of female sexuality, the dangers of religious repression, and the need for guidance. What happens when a woman who is coming into her own feminine powers and is forced to repress them suddenly unleashes them is simultaneously satisfying and horrifying. And it was a hell of an opening salvo to Stephen King's career on the silver screen. Number eight is a smaller, less supernatural, but no less intense thriller, one clearly inspired by King's own fears of fame and the relationship with his fans, and that's Misery. In this classic, which won Kathy Bates an Oscar, a famous novelist suffers a car accident in the middle of nowhere and winds up being nursed back to health and later imprisoned by Annie Wilkes, his unhinged, obsessed, self-described number one fan. Directed by Rob Reiner, now pay attention because you'll hear his name again too, this one is more suspense thriller than horror movie, but that's the brilliance of Stephen King. He can play in multiple genres when he needs to, as you'll see repeatedly later in this list. That being said, there is one scene of violence here, and you know the one, don't you? That could cause some people to reasonably label this film as a horror film. You know, you know, it's, it's probably for the best. <laughs> It's for the best. Oh, God! Number seven is The Dead Zone. And for heaven's sake, is this movie appropriate for the times we live in today? Another great director, this time David Cronenberg, and another fantastic lead performance by Christopher Walken as Johnny, a school teacher who goes into a coma after a car accident. Hey, another car accident. Stephen King has had a, uh, a pretty storied history with car accidents, hasn't he? Now, back to the dead zone, Johnny wakes up after a long coma with the ability to get psychic flashes of anyone he makes physical contact with. Now this one, uh, it's no surprise that this became a television series because the possibilities of this plot device are really kind of endless. Seeing and then trying to change the future. I mean, it's been done a lot before and since, but carried to this degree when he shakes the hand of a politician who will one day start World War III, the dead zone really gets the most out of this very high dramatic concept. Number six is The Stand, which was adapted for television into a three-night TV movie event. Directed by frequent collaborator Mick Garris, this is the adaptation that was deemed unfilmable for years. This massive, multi-character story about a post-apocalyptic world devastated by plague and the warring factions of good and evil that get drawn together. It's a huge undertaking and the sort of thing that today would have a huge budget and be 12 hours long and it would air on HBO and it would be full of graphic violence and gore and it would be awesome and it would win all of the Emmys one year. But back in 1994, a sanitized for television version was all we could muster up. And as a result, The Stand has its flaws. Cheesy effects that haven't aged well. Molly Ringwald, 
and an overly simplified story. But there were a lot of inspired casting choices like Rob Lowe and Bill Fagerbacke and Ruby Dee, and especially Matt Frewer as the trash can man. I keep going back to this one every now and again, and it still plays extremely well, despite the cheesy effects. Now, that being said, if HBO were to wait until Game of Thrones was over and then invest a whole bunch of money into making a big event series out of the stand, I would not exactly be mad at that. Number five is The Shining. Yeah, The Shining. Now, this is only so low on the list because it's less of a true adaptation than the others. This is a Stanley Kubrick movie. There can be no mistaking it. There can also be no mistaking the fact that it's one of the most effectively creepy movies ever made. It's slow, it gets under your skin, and it's so far away from what King envisioned, he disowned the film and rarely even talks about it. He even would go so far as to team up with Mick Garris to make a more faithful version for TV decades later as a way of sort of balancing the karma. That version was actually pretty good. This though, well, this is classic Kubrick all the way. Flawed, yes, but undeniably haunting. Number four is Stand By Me, another great film from Rob Reiner. This one, an adaptation of the novella The Body, and the first film on this list to have neither supernatural or horrific aspects to it. It's simply a moving coming-of-age story about four young boys who set out to find the body of a missing kid so that they can get their names in the paper. And more or less, that's it. Along the way, they bond, they tell stories, they dodge trains and older kids, and they find common ground with each other, before ultimately drifting apart the way all childhood friendships do. I recently watched Stand By Me again, having loved it in the early days of VHS, and it still holds up remarkably well. These kids are all going through some pretty heavy stuff, and it's incredibly moving to see these boys, who never get any respect from anyone in their lives, not their teachers, their peers, or even their families, finally find someone that will listen. This movie captures perfectly that feeling of being young and misunderstood and in way over your head. Number three is The Mist, directed by, well, well, how about that? Directed by Frank Darabont. And I've got to tell you, this movie is ostensibly a monster movie. It's about a strange mist that covers a small main town one day, bringing with it all sorts of nasty, malevolent beasties of all shapes and sizes. But the real story here is about the human monsters within each of our hearts. That's right, a group of human beings trapped inside a grocery store deal with the situation and evolve into monsters of their own. The mist is intense, it's icky, and it's brutally grotesque. And if that weren't enough, it's final twisted denouement when it comes I'm telling you, it's, it's brilliant, and it's horrific, and it's shocking, and it left me on the floor of the theater in stunned and reverent silence. You have never seen a horror film with this degree of brains and of balls, and I wager that you never will again, either. Ugh. Number two is It. And I mean, this is it, all right. The original miniseries, which was adapted from one of Stephen King's, well, easily his top three novels. Another one which was deemed potentially unfilmable due to its length, and a lot of its content, actually. And which was shown over two intense nights in 1990, and burned into the collective consciousness of all who were there to see it. Tim Curry, as the deadly manifestation of evil known as Pennywise, will haunt your dreams forever. And while there were still a huge amount of omissions from the original book, some cut for efficiency, and others because it was going to be shown on broadcast TV, this miniseries managed to capture the essence of this sweeping narrative of seven childhood friends doing battle with an ancient evil, then returning in their adulthood to face it one final time. This new version, which debuts later this year, has a lot to live up to. And number one is... Ah, uh, you know what number one is. You know what number one has to be, because it's an absolute classic. If you didn't know it was based on a novella by Stephen King, then you certainly should, and that's The Shawshank Redemption. I'm gonna tell you a personal story. I read the original novella years and years ago, from beginning to end, in one sitting, until the wee hours of the morning. And when I put it down, I felt such a rush as I've never gotten from a piece of literature before. I mean, the whole thing reads like poetry. And this film, directed once again by Frank Darabont, captured that feeling down to the last goosebump. The images that were conjured up in my head by the words on the page, somehow Darabont put them up there on the screen, even with a couple of tweaks to the story, and all those tweaks work too. This is a movie about hope. It's about being free, and it speaks to us all, and it goes to show that not only is Frank Darabont the undisputed best interpreter of Stephen King's writing, but it also shows that in order to know what is going to get under an audience's skin, a good writer of horror must know about all of the human condition, not just what we fear. He's got to know what we value, what we respond to, and in the case of Shawshank, what we all yearn for. Both in life, and in particular when we sit down to watch a movie, we want escape. We want release. 
There's no film in recent memory that provides that release more clearly and more literally than the Shawshank Redemption. That does it for this edition of Movies That Pop. Don't forget to follow me, the Colonel, on Twitter at Movies That Pop. And click the icon right down there to visit our channel if you'd like to see more. And I sure would say thank you, Sai, if you click the subscribe button while you're there and the thumbs up icon below. I'd like to hear your thoughts on my list in the comments as well. Have I left off one of your favorites? Oh, if so, I apologize. I have forgotten the face of my father. In the meantime, thanks for watching. I'm the Colonel, and may your days be long upon the earth.